Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah McCaffrey and I'm the manager of interdisciplinary arts at Asia Society. Thank you so much for joining us for Hacking the Syllabus, Critical Solidarities with Scott Kurishige and Adrian Marie Brown. So though we're gathering within the frames of this virtual space this evening, we want this to feel as engaging as possible. So we encourage you to participate and welcome you to join in the conversation via the chat if you're in the Zoom webinar right now, and if you're watching live from Facebook or YouTube via the comments. So to get us warmed up, um, I'll start off by asking us a question so we can do a type of virtual mapping together. And my question is, where are you all joining in from? So if you're in the Zoom webinar, please feel free to share that in the chat. Asia Society New York is situated on the Lenape Island of Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We pay respect to the Lenape peoples and also acknowledge that New York City has been a gathering spot and home for other indigenous peoples. This program is organized as a part of the inaugural Asia Society Triennial, which comprises the exhibition We Do Not Dream Alone and a series of related performances and programs. This event is the final one of the three-part series Hacking the Syllabus Critical Solidarities, which shares both perspectives and resources on building intersectional solidarities. The resource that's connected to tonight's event is Scott's syllabus from a class that he's teaching, Racism and Anti-Racism in Asian America. And you can find the syllabus on Asia Society's website and it will live there as a resource. Tonight, Scott will give a lecture related to his syllabus followed by a conversation with Adrian Marie Brown. And at the end, we'll have time for questions from the audience. It's my honor to introduce our speakers tonight. Scott Kurishige is professor and chair in the Department of Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies at Texas Christian University. He is the author or co-author of four books, including The 50-Year Rebellion, How the U.S. Political Crisis Began in Detroit. He served as president of the American Studies Association from 2019 to 2020. Adrian Marie Brown is the author of Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, and the co-editor of Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements. She is a co-host of the How to Survive the End of the World and Octavia's Parables podcasts. Adrian is rooted in Detroit. We are so incredibly excited to have these two wonderful folks close out this three-part series. And if we think of friendship as a vital form of critical connections, that's definitely present tonight as Scott and Adrian are longtime friends and have had that deepening. We are honored to have them here and excited to dig in. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Scott now for his lecture. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, I sense this is a relatively young audience um, and it's a Friday evening. So I know there are so many other places you could go and be right now uh, in our virtual world, Netflix, Twitter, TikTok, right? That you've chosen to be here on Zoom means uh, a great deal to me, uh, but it's obviously much bigger than me because we are here today to talk about the relationship of Asian Americans to social transformation. So thank you to everyone at the Asia Society, especially Sarah McCaffrey and for that generous introduction and for organizing this virtual gathering. It's always an honor to be invited to deliver a lecture on a core aspect of one's work, but it's far more exciting when your host says, hey, we'd rather have you engage in a conversation with Adrian Marie Brown because you won't find a more dynamic, creative, spiritual, sex positive, revolutionary organizer slash artist, facilitator, speculative fiction writer slash self-care counselor anywhere you look. Now I've altered my talk somewhat from the original description we developed uh, when we set this up in the middle of summer. First, because while the underlying features of white supremacy and global oppression have not changed, so much has happened to shape the context for this event. 
Beyond that, I would be squandering a golden opportunity if I didn't provide more of a foundation and a jumping off point for our conversation with Adrian Marie. We come from very different backgrounds and work very different day jobs. But there are two crucial things that link uh, Adrian and I together. First, we both moved to Detroit after spending most or much of our 20s pursuing revolutionary movement uh, building on the West Coast. In Adrian's case, as a leader in the anarchist movement and ruckus society, and in my case, as a student and community organizer, trying to revive the Marxist-Leninist movement that first emerged among Asian Americans and other BIPOC communities uh, in the 1960s and 70s. I moved to LA, uh, I moved from LA to Detroit 20 years ago, just after I turned 30, which tells you how old I am now. Um, and though it's obvious I'm the older of the two of us, I think, Adrian, you were almost also around 30, give or take a few years when you came to Detroit. Now, the second thing that unites us is that while um, we both have been blessed to be part of an incredible community of activists, organizers, family and friends in Detroit. You can see the indelible imprint of Grace Lee Boggs um, that's left on both of our works. And so I will be talking about how Grace challenged us to enlarge our thinking, to consider the role Asian Americans have to play in revolutionary politics and indeed are already playing. And actually I'd be terribly remiss if I did not mention a third point of connection between the two of us. Now, last month, Nadine Neber um, gave a brilliant lecture for this series on radical mothering. And this is a crucial aspect of Adrian Marie's work as well. In my case, Adrian was our doula when my youngest daughter was born. And I'll never be able to thank her enough for that beautiful gift she gave my partner, Emily Lawson and I um, six years ago. When we see revolution as a two-sided transformation of ourselves and our structures, Midwifery serves as a vital model connecting individual and social praxis. It is grounded in grassroots feminist praxis stretching back dozens of generations, predating both the Cartesian separation of mind and body and the capture of medicine and knowledge by capitalism and heteropatriarchy. It's why the late Vincent Harding, who was a close associate of Martin Luther and Credit Scott King during the civil rights movement and later worked directly with James and Grace Lee Boggs saw midwifery as a central metaphor for our tasks as movement builders. It resists hierarchical and linear models of leadership. It's not follow me because I have a plan to take us from point A to point B. Midwifery is about creating and nurturing conditions and relationships where growth, development, and transformation can occur. It does not dwell on what we are, but what we are becoming, both as individuals and as a society. And this is really crucial to Adrienne's concept of emergent strategy, which she draws via grace from author Margaret Wheatley. Rather than certainty, which define Newtonian science, the key word is possibility, the crux of complex science. You can insert your own meme here about watching Schrodinger's cat videos on YouTube. Now, keeping with the theme of hacking the syllabus, I want to use this emphasis on possibility as a framework for explaining my pedagogical approach to Asian American studies. In most parts of the country, Asian American studies is still, to borrow a term from Columbia professor May Nye, an impossible subject. It is literally a topic that students have no opportunity to pursue throughout their K through 12 education, or even college for that matter. Even worse, it's a topic of study and approach to education that students are not even aware is being actively denied to them. So when students do get into Asian American studies courses, the experience is frequently a revelation as it was for me three decades ago. It's what I was looking for my entire life, but I didn't know it until I found it. Students come away from their first Asian American studies course drawing conclusions like, I feel like my whole education up to this point has been a lot. Now, I just finished teaching a class called Racism and Anti-Racism in Asian America. And as far as anyone can tell, this is the first class on this subject ever taught at TCU. My campus is located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which has one of the largest and fastest growing Asian American populations in the country. There are elementary schools in the region that are actually 50 to even 90% Asian. And if you go out to the suburbs north of Dallas, like Plano or Carrollton, you can almost envision yourself like being in the middle of the San Gabriel Valley, the so-called ethnoburbs of LA. We spend a good deal of time exploring those areas because I have a 10th grader who, given the opportunity, could basically subsist on nothing more than boba, ramen, and xiao long bao. The development of Asian American studies in Texas at the university and K through 12 levels lags far, far behind places like California, but that also means dialectically, this is a site of potential and possibility. If you go to the suburbs of Dallas, you will find that the places that are most anti-Trump 
that have most flipped from red to blue are often places with the highest concentrations of Asian Americans. This phenomenon did not change the overall picture in Texas as some hoped in the last election, but it can account for the difference between Trump, Trump losing rather than winning um, the state of Georgia. There's a lot more we can say about the conscious sustained organizing that counts for these types of changes. Remember, California was dominated by conservatives well into the 1990s and was a national leader for right-wing and racist policies like Prop 187, three strikes and you're out mandatory life sentences, uh, plus the bans on affirmative action, gay marriage and bilingual education. Um, but I wanna complete this discussion about pedagogy and save that for a potential discussion. My class on racism and anti-racism started with a recognition that political discourse on Asian Americans is driven by two contemporary phenomena framing our study. Number one, Trump and the right-wing xenophobic response to the COVID pandemic, China virus, Kung flu, you know all about it, unleashed a wave of hate crimes and anti-Asian bias. In Midland, Texas, uh, let me pull my screen up here just to show you a couple of examples. So in Midland, Texas, there was an incident uh, where an Asian family was stabbed by an assailant in a Sam's Club parking lot, an act of attempted murder by a man who said he needed to stop the Chinese from quote, infecting people with coronavirus. Also this year, residents of Irving, Texas, one of those places where there are some um, elementary schools that are 90% or more Asian, received a note warning Indian and Chinese Americans if you don't, quote, leave the country without further delay, we will have no choice but to shoot mercilessly at workplace, in community, on pool, or on playground, bad grammar in the original. Um, so one of the things you can do with a 15-week class over the course of a semester is place incidents, incidents like this into structural and historical context by studying the history of exclusion laws that banned Asians from immigrating, immigrating to the US or becoming naturalized citizens, um, as well as policies and practices laws that forced my ancestors into concentration camps during World War II. We also watched the new PBS documentary, Sea Drift, to examine how that city on the Gulf Coast of Texas became the center of national attention 40 years ago when the Texas Klan attempted to drive all Vietnamese refugees out of the region. Students with a Latinx studies background drew connections to the racist exclusion of asylum seekers and the caging of children at the border, still ongoing, obviously. Um, a Muslim American student in the class led our discussion of racial profiling, detention without reason, and deportation after 9-11, connecting it to the hate crime she personally endured as a small child on 9-11. Together, we analyzed the multiracial and intersectional bases of American imperialism and white supremacy. Now, second, however, um, the police killing of George Floyd provided another flashpoint, right? The second flashpoint, one that precludes any in innocent assessment of Asian Americans as purely victims of racism and forces us to reckon with the role Asian Americans play in upholding and reproducing anti-Blackness. Minneapolis police officer Tu Tao became the national face of model minority complicity, challenging, challenging Asian Americans to recognize the degree to which our collective racialization under capitalism and white supremacy subjects us to state violence in different and often lesser ways than it does African-Americans. The model minority stereotype positions Asian-Americans as a universally studious, docile, hardworking, law-abiding subject. But this stereotype is not first and foremost concerned with how we as Asian-Americans see ourselves. Since the 1960s, it has primarily functioned as a stereotype that conservative whites developed to convince other white Americans that black demands for structural reform and anti-discrimination policies are unjustified. Look at how those Asians succeed just by pulling themselves up by their bootstraps rather than protesting and rioting. And yet combined with the relative ignorance and marginalization of Asian Americans within the media and K through 12 curricula, the prevalence of model minority discourse leads many Asians to internalize this insidious stereotype. In this way, it functions as an Asian American form of the respectability politics that can be found within all minoritized communities. Citing Viet Nguyen's argument in Time Magazine, I sought to frame my entire course with a challenge to the students to respond to the forced choice scenario that America places us into. If we are to be held up as a model, whether we like it or not, we can choose to be, quote, a model of apology or a model of justice. Now, Officer Tao's supporting role to Derek Chauvin in the murder of George Floyd 
but it's a pattern of behavior that links him to the 2 million Asian Americans who voted for Trump. The quest for inclusion in America means actively or passively embracing white supremacy and imperialism. At the same time, we should note that there has been an organized expression of anti-racist opposition to state violence, particularly from the Hmong com American community of the Twin Cities. In 2006, teenager Fong Lee was killed by the Minneapolis police in a notorious incident of police brutality that was whitewashed by entrenched structures of power. At a Hmong for Black Lives rally with um, Fong Lee's mother, Yua Vang, delivered an impassioned expression of solidarity with George Floyd's family. And this kind of call has resonated uh, throughout multiple other cities where activists have organized under the banner of Asians for Black Lives, including San Diego, Oakland, Sacramento, New York, and many other places. So to borrow a phrase from my friend Soya Jung, this is what it means to commit model minority, model minority mutiny. It's a tongue twister. Um, the awakening may occur in a classroom or in the course of organizing. In either case, the recognition that the model minority is a lie designed to keep us in our place within an oppressive system becomes the catalyst for a radical leap forward in political and social consciousness. consciousness. And this is why I wanna bring Grace Lee Boggs back into the conversation because Grace lived 75 years of her life as a radical organizer within the black community. Grace is rightfully held up as a revolutionary role model who defied the model minority. She'd be amazed, however, to see how much the sentiment now proliferates in posts on Instagram and even in tattoos on the bodies of those she has inspired. But it's just as important, if not more so, to highlight the unique vision of revolution that Grace developed and advanced. Revolution is not, in her eyes, where our side wins or where the formerly oppressed take power. It is a new beginning for humanity. In this way, revolution is inseparable from the evolution of the human race. And this helps us grapple with the question, what did Grace mean when she said Asian Americans have a special role to play in the revolution? Now, she was not encouraging Asian Americans to think that we are uniquely talented or uniquely oppressed. She was instead stressing that we are uniquely positioned to think and act dialectically, to see the predicament we have often been placed in, caught between white and black, between superpower and rival, and between colonizers and colonized, not as paralyzing, but as a challenge to bring about a paradigm shift in our thinking and movement building. Since the neoliberal turn of the 1970s, Asian Americans have become a convenient scapegoat for the multifaceted problems and intersecting crises tied to deindustrialization, corporate globalization, outsourcing, um, and the devastation of predominantly African American cities and urban communities. Most notably during the so-called Black Korean conflict that the media highlighted during the 1992 LA rebellion to the point that it overshadowed the brutalization of Rodney King and acquittal of the four LAPD officers caught on video. In response, as I'm trying to discuss in a book um, I'm working on called Neighbors in the Hood, the most visionary Asian American community organizers have recognized that we need a systemic multiracial analysis of the underlying conditions that devastated not only South Central LA, but also places like Detroit, the Bronx, and Philadelphia, where one of my role models, City Councilwoman Helen Gim, started in campaigns to stop the gentrification of Chinatown and restore public education and anti-Asian violence and has now been tagged by the media as quote, the most popular politician in Philly. In Detroit, the concept of justice for Vincent Chin takes on a new meaning in this context. Knowing that Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz got away with murder within a white supremacist legal system leads many to want retributive justice, right? To demand retribution. Asian Americans should stand up for our rights and Evans and Nitz should pay for their crime, right? But if we uphold an abolitionist critique of punishment and incarceration, the issue becomes far more complex. Shock and dismay at the lax treatment of Evans and Nitz by the courts did lead to calls to uphold victims' rights and impose mandatory minimum sentencing. Yet, we know that the principal casualties of those shifts in places like Detroit were predominantly African-American, often imprisoned for nonviolent drug offenses 
as the collapse of industry eliminated jobs, shuttered schools, and prompted a foreclosure crisis that undermined neighborhood stability. We thus come to appreciate that revolution means creating a whole new model of work and subsistence, a whole new foundation for community, a wholesale reinvention of education, and a whole new system of restorative and transformative justice. Starting with the creation of what the Detroit Coalition Against Police Brutality calls peace zones for life, self-sufficient and self-determining communities that establish healthy relationships among themselves where conflicts can be resolved through de-escalation and thus without the need for the police in the first place. This is the type of work that visionary Asian Americans are now doing in Detroit. Activists like Marsha Lee, who lives partially off the grid in an old house with her partner, their baby, and a family of ducks on an organic farm just down the block from the home of James and Grace Lee Boggs, Field Street. We can also find critical connections and critical solidarities emanating from the transnational work of Asian American activists addressing labor, militarism, and environmental issues um, overseas in places like China and other parts of Asia, Okinawa, um, as well as from Asian Americans who recognize their status as settler colonists in Hawaii and have supported Kanaka Maoli models of sovereignty that are showing us how to live in spiritual and ecological harmony through the indigenous resurgence movement. The point I want to end with here is this, we must be aware of both our positionality and our responsibility to our ancestors, but don't get stuck either as an individual or as a community dwelling on your place within the current social arrangement. The systemic collapse we are living through is rich with possibility. And the question we must all answer is, where do we go from here? And at that point, I want to turn it over to the person I know as the doula of revolution, Adrian Marie Graham. Thank you. Ooh -wee. What an incredible talk, Scott. Thank you so, so, so much. First, I just wanna say, um, Thank you for making it plain. And thank you for inviting me to be in this conversation with you. I think um, I was really excited because I'm like, I feel like people don't really recognize me as an Asian American scholar amongst the many things that I do. But I'm like, when I actually think about it, a huge portion of the scholars and thinkers and radicals and revolutionaries who shape emergent strategy and everything else I do, are Asian American thinkers, Asian American philosophers, you, Emily, Marsha Lee, Jenny Lee. Um, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking earlier today, I was like, oh, Mia Mingus? Uh, like, there's just so many people who, from Gopal Dayanini, you know, Marsha and Anne, I was just over making a mushroom log in their yard. Like, it's, it's where I'm learning all the things, all the things, all the things. And so, um, when, when you were speaking and you talked about that, that impossible subject, right? That it was like, I was someone like that. I was born and raised and educated in um, Department of Defense schools in the army. And I then went to college at Columbia and my mind was being blown in African-American studies. And I had that same experience of everything I've learned is a lie, everything. And I need to decolonize my mind, decolonize my mind. But all the things that I learned it wasn't until later that I understood almost all the thought systems that I learned were Asian and Asian American in root system. So if you look at emergent strategy, um, it's there's Buddhism, there's Tao Te Ching, there's all of those ancient systems. Even if you look at the somatics technology that I use, a lot of it is based in the Aikido work. Like there's, there's so many places like that. And then we come into uh, what does it mean to be alive today in the revolutionary footsteps of a Grace Lee Boggs and in the present footsteps of the leaders who have been shaping Detroit. So I'm grateful that you brought me into this conversation. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of questions for you. So I wanna be in the conversation with you from the place of my questions. And also at, after a while, if y'all give us a little bit of space, Scott and I will talk maybe for half an hour. And then we wanna hear from you all. What are the questions that you have? So as we're talking, if questions come to you and you want us to answer them, put them in the Q&A box here. And there's an opportunity for you to upvote things. So if you're like listening and you're like, I don't have my own questions, but I do wanna see, I wanna shape, I wanna know what questions are moving go in there and you can actually say, oh, this is a question I would most like to see answered so that when it's time, we can come there and we'll, we'll be able to answer the things. Um, one other thing I wanna, 
I really am excited about is this doula and midwife technology. So I was your literal doula, <laughs> um, which is one way of being a doula. But I remember the moment um, Ill and I, uh, Invincible Ill, Ill Weaver and I were both studying emergence. Um, and there was a moment where, and Ill remembers it. I don't remember it. You know, I'm like, I'm like, oh, is that how it went? You know, and Ill has told me many times where it was actually the metaphor of midwifery and doula that made Grace do one of those lighting up moments, you know, that she used to do where it would be like, oh, oh that's it right there. And, and, and just being like, we need to be midwives of the revolution, doulas of the revolution. And I think of that now all the time that she's one of the first people who made me understand that to be a uh, philosopher of was a movement role, was a movement technology. And to actually be a philosopher who was community engaged meant that you could be a doula of the ideas, a midwife of new ideas, new ways of people thinking. And so much of how Grace taught people to think was by asking provocative questions, questions that sent people back to the drawing board of like, oh, I thought I knew what I stood for. I thought I knew how I wanted to do that. But actually, I was just going along with groupthink, you know, which she was very suspicious of all the time. It's like, did you think that for yourself? Have you read the text yourself? Go back to the original text and actually learn it. And, you know, Grace, if she had to learn another language to learn the text herself, she would do that. She would translate it. She would figure it out. We benefit from a brain like that, even if we don't engage in that way. But I think that she was one of the first people who helped me understand that the way that I like to work with people is similar. I like to ask a question that then people have to um, in some way transform themselves in order to answer it, in order to figure out what the answer is. When she would ask us, what time is it on the clock of the world? You know, if you're thinking only of the scale of your own life, or if you're thinking only of the scale of one small portion of movement that you've participated in, it's easy to get hopeless. It's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to think there's no solution. But when you step back to that larger lens, and it's like, oh, what time is on the clock of the world? Like it's freedom time every day, all the time. And we are in a million experiments trying to figure out how to get there. And it didn't begin with us. She would easily say, let's go back and talk about the French revolution. Let's go back and talk about the Russian revolution. Let's talk about what it has looked like for people to create these changes. I think in this moment, we need a lot more people to start to see themselves as midwives and doulas of revolution. And I think one of the things we have to understand is whose voices and whose philosophies and whose thinking do we uplift in those moments uh, as we're thinking about these things. Because I don't wanna end up in a paradigm where it's Asians for black lives, but black lives have no sense of Asian lives or Asian struggles or Asian work and Asian shaping of the landscape. I'm really interested in how do we uplift the leaders of movements right now who are Asian leaders, Asian American leaders who are think, shaping the way we think about revolution and thought in this moment. Um, I think about Elliot Fokoy, I think about Ananda Litan, I think about Norma Wong, I think about uh, uh, Thaymori Sandarajan. I'm thinking about all these leaders who are shaping everything about how I think about revolution um, and being shaped by how I think about revolution and how other black and brown people are thinking about revolution. So those are some initial I was sparked by your thoughts and have my thoughts. I wanted to ask you, um, when you look at, you know, now we are five years after Grace has gone. When you look at the way movement is building in Detroit right now, what are the things you see as her imprints on the city that still inspire you or that feel really exciting to you? Thanks. You know, I'm, not in the city right right now. So obviously I'm not necessarily the best person to, to answer that question, but I wanted to start by taking a step back, as you said, right? Talking about the question of, of the doula, right? Um, yeah. As important in her own right, but also as a model yes. for re revolutionary leadership, because uh, this is, I think this is more broadly speaking to what, what is most important, what's happening at the grassroots in Detroit and, and all the other places you mentioned. Yeah. Is that, uh, we are divorcing ourselves from that old model of charismatic leadership, which yep. combined with a certain model of, of Marxist-Leninism or Vanguard Party leadership really was about, you know, there's one person that has the right, 
the right, correct ideas. Yes. We all have to study that person's idea. I mean, it could lead to, you know, in the most extreme cases, to a cult of personality, right? Absolutely. Um, but even short of that, it can lead to an overemphasis on dogmatic sectarian practices, right? Yeah. And that sense in which our growth is inhibited by that certainty that we already know, you know, um, where we're going and what we need to do. And we just need those those you know confused masses to, to get on board and follow us whether it's because right. you know they're black or they're workers or they're queer or whatever it is yes right. and, and that idea that no we have a responsibility to nurture the conditions right for a different type of growth and transformation as a doula doula doesn't like take over the show <laughs> the doula doesn't come in and say this is my no. baby like <laughs> exactly I'm i mean i think process, that's right? my favorite things about being in that role and one of the reasons why i laugh when people are like try to put me on a pedestal, you know, cause that's what happens, you know, the celebrity culture is still there, right? So people are like, oh, Adrian, now you're the something. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm a doula. We, you know, uh -oh. is reminding someone you have this power, right? You're reminding the birthing parents, you have this power. You have kind of justice that they need. Did I freeze a little bit? I don't know if it was me or you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll say this again, just in okay. case. So the one thing I, the thing I have always loved about being in the doula role is it's not, I come with all the answers for your body. It's you birthing parents. You have a sense of the kind of birth you want, and you have a kind of sense of the, the kind of possibility you want, and you can feel within you and between you all kinds of data that I don't know. And I think of the same thing for organizers is we should not arrive into a city or a place or a community or our own home or anywhere. Like I know exactly how this has to go and you have to conform the way you think to the way I think. I, instead it's, you have so much power. Do you even understand the capacity you have for creating miracles? You have that within you. And when you see a community unleash that, you know, something gets born and then I think we get really um, enamored of that birth moment. You know, mm -hmm. it's like something gets born, but then it has to be sustained. And I think what we see sometimes is the energy moves away. You know, it's like, wow. Okay, and now we wanna look for the next wow. And I think the, the doula understands like you stay in relationship. You know, you fall in love with the child, you fall in love with the family and you wanna stay in relationship. You wanna watch the children grow. and. I think that's what the long-term work is. So when I look at the landscape of Detroit right now, it's hard for me to even point to an organization that doesn't have the imprints of some fingerprint of the work that Grace and Jimmy were doing together. You know, it was for a long time Detroit summer and the projects that were associated with that. But that then all those people grew up. And so now we have the Boggs School and there's the Boggs Center, but a lot of them went into the Allied Media Conference, Allied Media Project space, which has then spawned all these other sponsored projects. That, you know, I'm like, oh, when I came to Detroit, I think a lot of these projects were maybe at the teenage, you know, early adulthood phase, right? They've been around for a while, but I've gotten to watch many more projects and dueled several into existence myself that are all still shaped by these ideas of, complex movement building, complex leadership. And when I say complex, I don't mean um, hard to understand, right? I don't mean like, ooh, it's so complex, right? Mm -hmm. What I mean is it's a whole systems way of looking at something. It's a whole systems way of thinking. So much of what Grace and Jimmy were moving was like, we have to not just think of what happens in the room when we're organizing. We may wanna talk about how do we get around? We need some kind of biking situation. And how are we feeding ourselves? We need some kind of gardening situation. And who's making sure the babies learn this philosophy? We need a school. It's complex in that way. Like, how do we think of the whole community, the whole system? Um, when we think about revolution, every single part of how we be has to be at the table as a part of the conversation. And I, I definitely feel like I'm trying to continue in that work. I, I also want to say, and I say it every day, I think of my life, that Grace said that we have to transform ourselves to transform the world. I think we also have to self doula, right? Mm -hmm. We have to self, we have to encourage the best of ourselves forward and look inside and say, where am I out of alignment, right? Where am I not, um, you know, when I'm a doula, I'm like, yes, 
open. You got this. You can do this, you know, while trying to slay the dragon of like the medical industrial complex. And I feel the same thing inside myself is how do I slay the dragons of these systems that exist within me while also saying yes to the future that is also seeding itself inside of me. If I'm not transforming it within myself and doulaing that next world within myself, I'm not going to be able to bring that into being out in the world. It's not going to happen. And I think that that was one of the, that's to me, one of the most controversial ideas um, when it comes to movement work, because most of the way I was socialized to do movement work was I'm trying to fix other people who are not yet as radical as I am. And it's so different to have a, a, a commitment to constantly, continuously trying to radicalize myself as I learn and receive more data and have to change um, in the ways that my community needs. Yeah, I mean, bringing it back to the question of, of teaching, right? Yeah. The best teaching comes from not putting ideas in people's heads, but drawing ideas out of their heads, right? It's and this very. is what, you know, Paulo Freire's ideas have influenced radical movement building in Brazil and Latin America and other parts of the global North as well, right? That the goal is, revolution is not, again, about us taking the place of people in power. It's about people preparing themselves for self-governance, right? In a that's more right. democratic, humane way. And that's why, you know, um, Grace and I were really drawn to uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's concept of the multitude. Instead of thinking about the masses, right? It's just that's a matter right. of the masses to take the, the power that's rightfully theirs. The multitude means that we may share this common goal, but we're not driven by one sort of vanguard party marching in step, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Asian Americans, on the one hand, were like some of the most, because of the models from Vietnam and, and China, were some of the most, ad, uh, biggest advocates of the sort of vanguard party model of, of Marxist-Leninist revolution, right? Um, and yet, I think we're reflective enough to think about what were the limits of that, to see the, the, that the ways that both advanced struggle in the 20th century, but also created new contradictions, bumped up against limitations, created some steps backwards, right? And, and had to think. So I think that's why Grace found the, this sense of philosophical thinking among Asian American activists when, when she sort of rediscovered them um, um, late in her life. Um, and I think for me, going back to sort of the analysis of oppression and, and how it leads to movement building, it, it comes from that sense of, right? I mean, Bell Hooks talked us, taught us that generally the, the privileged view of the margins, right? That moving from margin to center is very powerful. I think that had a lot to do with Asian Americans. Some of the best of Asian American studies comes from recognizing that Asian Americans have not been at the center of, of US society and therefore um, have had to both critique whiteness, but also understand blackness as an oppositional way of, of, of viewing race to have that in double or triple consciousness, right? About, about US That's society. I think that was important and at best it's made Asian American thinkers and activists more sensitive to the, the, the issue of marginality uh, in general. When you think about um, some of the most important people doing this work, um, I think about people, right, who are doing that type of, of, of care work to borrow um, Leah's book. Um, but I think about the work Ai Jin Pu has done with domestic workers exactly. and how she's done that work with Alicia Garza. I mean, there's just so many connections about people who, who weren't about sort of putting themselves forward as charismatic leaders, but nurturing conditions for movement. And I think that had a lot to do with, with Grace coming into Detroit in a different way that she said something like for 10 years, she studied and humble, yes. worked on understanding and, and being a, a, a source of uh, just being, uh, being able to, to aid what was going on before she put herself in a position to say, okay, I know what, where this movement is going. I try that same approach. I think you know that that humility is very important. Yeah. To come into Asian America, not as some of the, as so many of these you know gentrifiers has done, or these you know um, uh, uh, quick fix folks have done. Dan Gilbert being the latest, right? We're going to save this city, or we're going to you know turn it around overnight. Folks that have come and said, look, there's a rich history of movement building already. There's a rich history of of black migration and community building had a better sense of understanding the city before trying to you know, intervene and change it. So I think that's been yeah. important too. And all the folks you mentioned, I think are models of that, but I think at, at our best, Asian American activists are that way in this country at all. That, that yes, no one likes being 
on the margins in the sense that you're called a foreigner and you're subjected to hate crimes and people don't respect okay. your civil rights or even your place within a movement. But if you think about that as a way to um, recognize, you know, we have a lot to understand <laughs> before yeah. we before we propose solutions, then I, I think that's been one of the actually the. Yeah. I like that. And I also think there's something really beautiful that you're teasing out here that has been important to me in my learning process, which is that model minority thing, that way that we get pit against each other is like, oh, you, that whole thing about being in proximity to whiteness, you know, the way white supremacy organizes the entire world around itself. And it makes it hard for such a long time to have a meaningful solidarity because everything is going through the prism of white supremacy. We're getting educated about each other through the prism of white supremacy. And then it's like, when we actually finally break those walls and get to be in right relationship. And I'll say for me, it was, I had to actually come into those relationships. I had to get to know Jenny. I had to get to know Grace. I had to get to know people and be like, this is not what I was socialized to understand as where you would sit in society and what you would fight for. And the fact that when I met Grace, I'm like, you've been fighting for this for 30 years for my liberation, I, I didn't know that, you know, that's not what I had experienced, what I had been told, expected to experience. And what I found was, you know, you learn that technology of people of color, the terminology of people of color, and it wipes away all these ways that we need to be able to have nuance about the places where we actually have overlapping experiences and the places where we have divergent experiences and recognizing each of us has been made less of ourselves in relationship to this false idea of white supremacy. And each of us, each of our communities and societies has work to do to get back into relationships amongst ourselves. And something I wonder about, because this is something that's really prevalent in the black community, there's so much around colorism and holding all of these hierarchies that are still in relationship to white supremacy that even inside of movement spaces, we're really um, holding, working, fighting, na navigating. And I wonder how that functions in terms of this solidarity work, right? Mm -hmm. Is there is there um, an equal, right? An equal or parallel thing that's going on inside of Asian American organizing and Asian American community spaces. Like, I feel like one of the things from the outside perspective, it looks like is I'm like, Asian includes so many divergent things, <laughs> right? Like really, really wildly diverse cultural spaces and cultural um, ways of being. And then to come into the US and then have it be clustered. It's just like, y'all are just all one thing. I imagine that it actually creates for some internal um, chaos that then makes it hard to figure out like how from this place to be in solidarity with other folks. Yeah, I mean, it definitely does. I mean, there's certainly a lot of people of Asian ancestry in the US that right now are on the wrong side of history, right? Some of that comes from the fact that there are people in Asia on the wrong side of history and people yeah. who allied with US imperialism in Asia and you know are, are continuing to do that here, right? Um, and so I think that's part of it. Obviously, there's you know anti-blackness that in, in Asia and, and people bring that here, or they learn that when they come here. So my again, my point is sometimes we get in these debates about model minority, and it's like it's like we're trying to define social and political positions as if they're here for all eternity, like who's gonna be the most radical, who's the least radical, who might be in the middle and maybe a little dependable sometimes. When the reality is the only reason to understand those social positions is to overturn them, right? To over, overcome them. And so I think while again, there are all these reasons why there are some Asian Americans voting for Trump or you know, yeah. supporting you know, um, regressive, uh, white supremacist policing or, or, you know, border patrol. When people do come into consciousness, you can't really be Asian American without thinking about uh, what it means to be part of a pan-ethnic coalition, right? That's yeah. not something you're born with, right? I didn't grow up thinking of myself as Asian American. I thought of myself as, you know, Japanese or yeah. like, am I Japanese or American? Asian, Asian American was a political identity that yeah. made me think about my relationship to other people in movement building. And it's not an identity you can take on, at least not in Asian American studies or Asian American community activism without challenging the model minority. So that's yeah. sort of first and foremost, not what is your identity in the abstract, but what is your identity in relationship to this country's history of white supremacy and anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity, right? And it's not like we 
overnight, we like perfect it all. And like, you know, um, it's a struggle. It's an ongoing, to me, it's still an ongoing struggle to, to understand, you know, um, um, these relationships. Um, but that's what moving building is, right? It's about that ongoing negotiation and struggle and that sense of becoming rather than already being, you know, or already having arrived. Um, so I think that's important that Asian Americans, um, in addition, again, to that sense of humility that comes from being on the margins, have uh, at, at our best that sense of always thinking about solidarity um, and, and having that sort of self-criticism of the way in which we've been positioned in relation to whiteness, because that's happening now in every community, right? I mean, you got- I mean, the, it's deep. Yeah. It's, it is in every community. And I think there's moments, and one of the things I'm always thinking about is like, how do we stop the, I think of it as a sort of a crabs in a barrel over attention, right? So I think about attention liberation and how do we understand that we actually do have an abundant amount of attention to give? Because I think sometimes it's like, oh, only one community can be in the center at a time. And, and if we're, you know, it's like, if we try to talk about multiple issues, then that's somehow taken away. You know, in this moment with the coronavirus and the way that the anti-Asian racism has just burst up, right? then I'm like, it's actually really important that I am willing to stand up and stand in the way of and have the back of and have the front of and protect um, all the Asian American organizers and Asian people in my life who might be under attack in this moment. It's important that I stand up ideologically against the ideas, but it's also important physically that I'm willing to like go out and say, no, like th this is not how we're gonna behave. It's important in terms of how I think about the economy and where I wanna spend my dollar and all of those, all those pieces come to mind and I think it's possible to do that without saying, oh, that decenters the work of Black Lives Matter. In me, I'm like, no, I have an abundant amount of radical attention. <laughs> like I've got so much to give and I can totally be all the time living inside of a Black Lives Matter centered, um, you know, for me, it's a, a Black, queer, a feminist and anarchist and abolitionist lens. I'm always walking with that. And it gives me enough attention to also be in meaningful solidarity with the people that I'm um, in organizing relationships with and with the people, you know, fundamentally, I, I don't want there to be humans who are outside the realm of my care or who are outside the realm of my attention. And I'm trying to constantly grow um, to a limitless amount of, of attention. But right now I'm also aware, you know, I'm like, okay, in a given hour, how much time, who do I give that time to? I prioritize black and brown leadership. I prioritize those things. And, but that includes for me, you know, like I think Ijin is one of the most incredible humans to ever live, much less to get to organize in the same world that she's creating change in. And there's a lot of the people that we've already named who are like that. I think of Amita Swadin um, and the work that they're doing with Mirror Memoirs, which is like changing the landscape of how we talk about child sexual abuse and changing the way we understand how much like, you know, the cultural secrecy inside of Asian communities allows for a different level of sexual harm to persist and perpetuate. There's things like that that I'm like, oh, that's opening a new landscape for all of us to learn from and all of us to increase the care we can give ourselves in our own communities and the care we can give across communities. I love looking at stuff like, you know, how we each get trained to keep cultural secrets in different ways how we each get trained to you know, protect our culture in different ways and how some of that protectionism keeps us from true solidarity, keeps us from truly getting to know each other or keeps us from doing more than a surface level cultural appropriation of each other, which I think is also a really fascinating thing between black and Asian cultures is that I feel like in both directions, there's this like, are we appreciating each other's cultures? Are we just grab and run? <laughs> you know what's happening between our cultures and then how does that spill into what happens between us ideologically and in movement, you know? Um, I remember going to Japan and seeing these afros and being like, how, how, how did that happen? And how, what does that mean in terms of what black lives mean in this space, right? I also have to say as a multiracial person that I'm really, you know, I, I mentioned this before, but I was raised in the army environment and almost all the first people that I met who were Asian were mixed Asian people, black and Asian people. And I think a lot of times we leave, we leave that out of the conversation. Those of us who are multiracial and who are walking in these multiracial familial environments and community environments, it's like, where do we 
fit into these larger conversations around the solidarity when it's like, oh, you're talking about solidarity between the parts of myself or folks who are holding all of that within them. And I think there's actually a really interesting role to play for people who are multiracial if we get more intentional about what we are holding. I think right now, a lot of the tendency is to deny that there is um, that both end and to just be like, you know, especially once you get radicalized, you're like, I don't wanna have anything to do with those oppressors, <laughs> I am this. <laughs> and then it's like, wait, no, there's a, there's a radical responsibility to hold the whole. What is the whole of your lineage without shame, right? This is what you were born into, how do you hold it? And so I see a lot of my mixed race, Asian American friends and I'm, I'm like, how do we bring in the whole story here? Bring in, how do you get to not be a bridge that people walk across, but a multitudinous place that can hold uh, culture in new ways and ways that could actually provide deeper solidarity. Yeah, I think that obviously it doesn't come from just, you know, being born mixed race. It comes from people being put in positions where they've been challenged to address certain individual and social questions. And then exactly. the res that's part of really what positions some of us in society to have more cutting edge ideas, right? Or roles to play. It comes from the, the dialectical challenge of being forced to answer questions about yourself, sometimes when you don't even want to, right? And then, and then that forces you to think about society in more complex ways. I wanna throw one question back to you before we go to the, to the audience. Okay, because then I'm uh, like, I've got, we've got good audience questions too, so. <laughs> you were talking about Black Lives Matter, right? Yep. Um, and you know, Black Lives Matter does not mean, as you said, there's an abundance, right? Of radical attention that we can have for Black Trans Lives Matter, mm -hmm. Black queer lives matter, Black women's lives matter, right? Um, and yet, um, anytime you have a slogan, some will want to reduce it, right? And yeah. others will want to expand it. So That's how right. do you struggle with that? Just like I'm trying to show, you know, the model minority could be something that becomes, that narrows right. the essence of what, how we analyze Asian Americans down to something really yeah. rudimentary, or it can be a starting point for understanding the complexities of white supremacy and capitalism more broadly. How do you start with Black Lives Matter, which is not something you came up with, but you know you see around yeah, yeah, you, yeah. And, and and move towards that more abundance of radical attention rather than the narrowing that that some forces would would yes. I mean, I really love this because there is a need. It's like how do we be specific without being reductionary? And I think I'm always trying to figure out how to do that because I find that one we either we tend to go one way or the other, where it's like if you're trying to speak about one thing, you have to say a laundry list of every single thing in order to speak about that one thing, or you speak about it and you have to exclude everything else. And I find that I'm trying to actually hold, um, I'll back it up in order to even say this. One of the things that is fascinating to me is to constantly remember that race is this construct that of an organic nature, none of our peoples created this, right? None of our peoples was like, hmm, like you said, you grew up as like, I'm Japanese. Like I, you know, my, my lineage of people come from Japan <laughs> and then, you know, like, and then this concept of Asian American comes a construct that makes it easier for whiteness to um, hold the container of othering. And the same thing, you know, for black folks, it's like my, my ancestors are Nigerian and they come from Cote d'Ivoire and they come from Ghana and they come from Morocco. And then this construct of race, right, tries to reduce all the nuance of all that rich history, all the songs, all the languages, everything that my, my people, the original instructions that my people were given, all of that's supposed to get condensed into this, this construct, this limited construct of Negro. Um, and so I think first we have to deal with like, oh, there's this trauma that has happened in so many locations to try to shrink, 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 and shrink all the cultural divergence, all the wisdom, all the original instruction that we all receive. And then here we show up in movement, trying to assert something. And so for me, when I say black lives matter, I mean, all black lives matter. And it, I don't have to, you know, in my mouth, what's coming out of my mouth. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. I don't have to make a long list of all of that. It's what it's, it's so intuitive to me that I mean, all the lineages matter and all the present black lives matter and all the iterations of being black matter and blackness is not a monolithic way of being it's many many ways of being some of which i deeply disagree with right like i deeply deeply disagree with um, the heteronormity that is prevalent in in our communities i deeply disagree with the homophobia that is prevalent in a lot of our communities i deeply disagree with 
a way a lot of our people run towards capitalism, like give me some more of that, right? I have empathy, right? I can see the analysis that led to that. So for me, I'm like, we have to figure out how we find language that allows us to feel expansive inside the language. And um, social media, I think is makes that particularly challenging because in social media, you can have a whole movement of people come together and say, this is how we want to speak about ourselves. And then one troll can come on and be like, yeah. And then people are like, oh, the troll, you know, spoke. And I don't think we've made the distinction yet of who are legitimate critique voices online and who are not. And so I think we respond to everything as if it's a legitimate critique still. And I see that happen in our movements too often. And I'm always like, wait a second. You know, I, and I've said this literally, like <laughs> there's many, many people you can ask inside of movement, but I'm like, so this movement has however many thousands of people as an active part of it in the real world, right? These are people who will go out in the street, they will stop traffic, they will shut down trains, they will, you know, banners off of buildings, they will go door to door and knock. These are real organizers in the world. And then this person is online and they have 5,000 followers who will take zero actions in the real world. And we're letting that person try to redefine or take away from the solidarity we have built in the real world. I think it's a real problem that we find ourselves in that, you know, being pulled, pulled around all the time. Often I'm just telling movement people get offline. Like, unless you can use that space to positively move what you want to move, your identity can't be defined in a space that has no, um, where there's no body to body accountability, right? And what I have found is a lot of when people are saying we need to make these distinctions is because we're coming up against phobias. So when people are saying, oh, we have to say black trans lives matter, it's because we're like, because we got so many transphobic people out here. You know, anytime you hear someone making that distinction, what you're actually hearing is the pain of erasure that phobia provides and pushes us into. And people saying, we will not be erased. You, your phobia will not work here. So we wanna make sure you're very clear coming in the door that Black trans lives matter here, Black disabled lives matter here, but, right? And we go into it. Um, I think it's necessary right now for, for in the battle internally to our community, in the battle internally, that we do that pushing and, and getting more precise. But I also think that we have to, you know, Maurice Mo Mitchell, who's um, at the Working Families Party right now, he said this thing recently that really moved me, which was we have to have a low bar to entry and then really high standards once you get in the door. And I think about that a lot that I'm always trying to figure out how can I speak in a way that invites more and more of my people to wanna to come to the door. Even if um, right now it seems like we're at odds with each other politically or we're at odds with each other ideologically. How can I get us into a conversation where we can change each other, where we can really be in a, in a dialogue? And Grace taught me that, right? Grace taught me that. I wanna just briefly tell a story before we go to the questions, which is, my dad was in the, in the US Army for 30 years. And I love the crap out of my dad. And my dad is like, you know, um, he's not someone I would describe as a radical, right? He's someone who's like very excited when Obama came along. He watches all the different morning news shows, you know, um, he's informed, but he's not a radical person. And I was nervous to bring him around Grace, to have him meet Grace. But I also felt like it was imperative to me that my parents meet this person who I basically claimed as an ideological grandmother. I was like, you need to know this person while she's alive, she's shaping me. So I brought them and they sat in Grace's living room and watching my, my dad and Grace have a conversation taught me more about organizing than almost any other experience I ever had because she addressed him as a person of dignity. She addressed him as a person of thoughtfulness and she asked him the same questions that she had asked me and that she asked everyone. What time do you think it is on the clock of the world? Why do you think Obama is making these mistakes? What do you, and she just had the most real present time politically informed conversation with him, but as, as someone who had all the potential that she had to be a revolutionary. And it changed the way he and I talk still to this day. I engage with my father so much more holistically. And I think I have dragged him joyfully left um, inside of that. But I'm so grateful all the time that that I got to witness what it looks like to be deeply and easily sitting in your ideas, right? Grace was like easily, she was like, I have no, there's no question in me that these are the best ideas that you can come across. And I've lived 99 years and I know this. And uh, because there's no question, I don't feel defensive over the ideas. I feel inviting. How can I invite more and more people to be in the conversation with me? Because if they get in the conversation, they'll also be interested in these ideas. 
And I think to me, that's, that's when you're getting in the sweet spot of ideological organizing is let's, let's, I, I trust myself to be in a conversation with you and move and be moved and move us all. Yeah. All right. I love talking with you, Scott. <laughs> we could always go for so long. Um, so we have some questions. And like I said, if you're in the Zoom with us, you can upvote these questions. So I'm just gonna share the, the one that has the most uh, votes so far. How can we express our solidarity with the BLM movement as Asian Americans without centering ourselves, which can feel performative? Mm. I have mixed feelings when I see signs or posts of insert for black lives, since I think our presence and actions can provide that support without centering or crediting ourselves. But at the same time, I understand how powerful the expression of BIPOC solidarity is. I mean, think? I think that consciousness is simply a big part of, of you know, the not solution, but the, the right approach, right? That, that recognizing that, you know, that, that, that never question is never gonna go away. You could yeah. do this work for 20 years, you know, and still have, have to grapple with that same question because conditions right. change, new people. So I, I think that's, that's just a big part of it. And, and yeah. you don't solve those questions. I mean, you know, you can go read history. You know, I've tried to write about this. You've written about um, some of this history. Grace has written about it. But ultimately you find people that you can work with, people that don't out and out reject your role, you know, in an organization or a campaign. Yeah. And you struggle through these questions in practice and you collectively develop better practices, right? That's, that's, right. that's I think, you know, again, Grace yeah. had me reading her old takes on Mao on <laughs> practice from the 1930s. And, you know, even though there have been new contradictions in the Chinese move, movement and China since then, there are some, some methods that, that people developed in the course of movement building that, that I think are still working. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think there's always, I think, being on on guard for the performative is always a good thing right it's a good practice like yeah, we can all and especially you know with with the age of social media and overlapping with organizing i think the performative has reached new heights um and i think it's something to always pay attention to in emergent strategy i uplifted the principles from the asians for black lives um mm. uh, effort and it, they were important to me because part to me part of the answer is that it's that you're not just showing up to be like look performative solidarity, but that you are doing it from a place of principle, that there's a set of principles that guide you around what you are centering in that moment. I think the other answer for me is about relationship, right? Is if you're in relationship with black folks and you're showing up to the thing, to a march or to another event, um, and if you're trying to take too much space, black folks in your relationship, we'll let you know. Right? We're like, uh, why are you centering yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and, and if you're not getting that feedback, if you're getting the feedback, instead of us being like, thank God you came, um, let's be in conversation, then you're good. Right. Um, yeah. I think that, I think it's it, to me, the place where the performative becomes impossible is when you are in actual relationship because actual relationship, then you can ask also for feedback, right? If you show up to one March and it feels like it's taking up too much space or too performative, you get that feedback. How did, how was it having us show up? What are other things we could do? And I point to this, like, I think of Catalyst, I think of um, uh, showing up for racial justice and other groups of white people who've been showing up and how it's been a dance, right? Over the years, figuring out, you know, my history was with ruckus. And I remember that being a big conversation is how do we do direct actions where white people are showing up on behalf of, or to fight for, or, you know, do this work for black lives? What is the right role? And, you know, it's like, it's not just to stand there. It's not just to be there but maybe it's to be the police liaisons. Maybe it's to be the people who are arrestable and to use your privilege that way. Maybe it's to actually create a line that protects, right? The black organizers and so on and so forth. That was not something, you know, white folks, if they had just come up with that themselves, like, you know what we'll do is go protect them. I'm like, no, no, no. You wanna be in relationship and, and strategy, right? And figure out what is the right strategy for this moment, for these conditions. Um, so that would be my biggest answer is like, first check within, you know, look for the performative inside yourself and really check out what's going on there. And then be in a community that is working in principle, right? Yeah. So you're not just showing up by yourself as like an Asian for black life, but that you're in community of Asians who are organizing for many things, including this. And then 
um, and then be in relationships with black people where there can be feedback um, and, and dynamic relationships of solidarity. Well, you're really modeling for us how to get beyond these authenticity traps. Like you're either totally down with the black struggle or you're like totally, you know, yeah. not right. That right. it's an ongoing negotiation and you're showing that there are ways in which we can ask questions. Who are we accountable? What are our standards of accountability, right? So That's I'll just right. stop there. I know there are other questions. <laughs> well, well, there are. And, and I think this, this piece around too, how do you get in those authentic relationships? That's one thing I want to say, because people ask me that a lot. Well, how do you get a really, you know, an authentic relationship with someone who's really different than you? I'm like, you ask, right? You ask. Like, I asked Grace, <laughs> you know, I showed up to her house and I was just like, I, I want to, I'm learning from you and I want to keep learning from you. Yeah. And she was not, you know, she was like not into the mentor language that I came to her with. She was like, but you can, <laughs> you know, at least yeah. she laughed in my face when I said that, but she was like, you can come be my friend. And right. It was like, you, you have to ask I think sometimes people are so scared because then it's like to acknowledge that you don't have any black friends you know it it's, it's scary but then it's like you ask and you start to begin a friendship and I, I do think that that is so important is in your own circle make sure that you're building and you have those authentic relationships well and that's why I mean social media can be such a you know a bottomless pit right of yeah and literally sometimes of like who's literally real. an endless like, scroll. Literally, sometimes the social media people are bots and they're fake. That's, that's, but when they're not, even the it, it can just it's it's not right. It's 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 just about speaking in 140 characters at a time. And I'm right, yeah. you're wrong, and you're right. It's 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 through the nurturing. That's the again the doula work. Exactly. So the next question we have, and I just realized I didn't say. Oh, this that one was from an anonymous attendee. So this next one is from um, May San Chan. I may be saying that wrong, but M-E-I-S-A-A-N Chan. So much of these oppressive systems depend on ego, the domination of me over the other, the glorification of ego, et cetera. But also so many Asian philosophies talk about non-self, impermanence of the self. How do you see this value and tradition contributing to a new revolutionary leadership? I think incorporating this non-self leadership could be revolutionary at the core. And there's an additional piece on there from a Sumana Mandala and how do we as Asian Americans center that without minimizing the centuries of trauma of black and Asian people as well. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex question, but I, I'm gonna try to answer it in a simple way. You know, So when people read Grace Lee Boggs, we talked about that humility she had as someone who wasn't black, but came into the black community and learned mm -hmm. from it, from prominent people like CLR James and also from workers and you know people on her block. But yeah. Jimmy Boggs also had that humility coming from the South where people had to survive as a community, right? So his phrase was, we are only somebody in relationship to many other bodies, right? So that revolutionary humility, I think it, it's, it is rooted in certain ways in which we're positioned racially, you know, and with regard to gender, class and sexuality, but it's also something that can become a collective uh, uh, um, value that, that unites us across those boundaries. Yeah, I had the same initial feeling, which is like, um, you know, just because just because some place is the is the place that's like develops the most text or puts out the most learning about something, doesn't mean it's the only place where that thought occurred. And so, I, you know, I feel this. I'll be reading Buddhism, and I'm like, oh, this really deeply aligns with what I've learned from indigenous communities in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and concepts of Ubuntu and concepts that I've learned in other language in other ways in other places. And I cannot argue with the fact, you know, for me, the Tao Te Ching is like, that's my book, right? Like if I'm really in a struggle and I can't figure out what to do as a leader, for me, that, that, that one works really well, but I don't hold it above anything else. You know, I'm just like, oh, this is a universal truth. And yeah. this yeah. is a really beautiful way that a universal truth was written in the same way um, I often have people come to me about emergent strategy and, you know, emergent strategy is all about the impermanence of impermanence of anything, right? It's like God is change, change is the constant. And then people say, oh, I see this in there. I see this in there. And to me, um, what I know is it poured through me, it channeled through me. I felt it deeply from within me as much as I felt it, it from my scholarship. And I think that's because all of us are designed to tap into these universal truths. And all of us have some obstacles that keep us from that. That um, Octavia Butler, my other great teacher who I like everybody please read, she talked about the fundamental flaw of humanity as the combination of our hierarchy and our intelligence. 
And the fact that because we are always in that combination, we're always trying to figure out our better and worse than, better and worse than. Um, and I think, you know, to bring that second question into it, it's if we recognize uh, that all of us have experienced trauma, all of our peoples have histories of war, have domination, have genocides, have rapes, have militarized, organized colonizations, all of our peoples have that. What we don't all have is the education that tells us that how much commonality there is between all of our stories. For me, so much of my political education was learning these stories are common human stories, which means our struggle and our revolution are, is a common struggle. It is a struggle that all humans are in against the forces of dominance and the forces of greed and the forces of um, short-term thinking versus thinking seven generations or thinking long-term. Um, I love thinking of myself as a species member, right? It gives me the most peace that I can experience is to remember, ah, I am of this complex species that is trying to figure out how to live on earth. And inside of that, I get the blessing of being a black person. <laughs> inside of that, I get the blessing of being a black person who has learned from an Asian person who learned from black community. We all chose to live in this black city and so on and so forth. Um, all right, that was my answer. I'm making this so it shows that we did answer it and it's done. So the next question on here was, could we get a list of the Asian American activists mentioned in this talk. It's sad, I, I don't know most of the people mentioned besides <laughs> like, like Grace. I think we so, can try to post a follow-up, yeah. We can, well, I was gonna say too, I think to that there all. are captions being written for this. And so captions, you know, there, there might be a transcript that we can pull out from that, but I would totally be down um, to write up the list of people that I mentioned. I can also like type them in the chat um, if that would be of use to people um, and we can figure that, figure that out. I'll just say one quick thing. I was fascinated to see that Julie Sue, who I knew 25 years ago from the um, Jessica McClintock boycott when one of the subcontractors refused to pay, went out of business and Jessica McClintock wouldn't pay the uh, Asian women that were sewing her, you know, expensive prom dresses. Um, I met Julie through that struggle. I haven't seen her much since then, but, you know, it's interesting that it's come down, I don't think Bernie Sanders is in the running for labor sector. It's come down between her primarily and mm -hmm. Andy Levin, who's a Detroit area person, very well connected to organized labor, Democratic Party, right? And Julie, coming out of the West Coast, comes out of the worker center movement, immigrant rights, Asian American, you know, women of color movements. And, and, and it shows that, that she's a reflection of how much neoliberalism has transformed labor in this country, right? That most of the work now is being done by these women and subcontractors, immigrants, yep. undocumented folks, you know, yep. women of color, um, transnational labor networks, um, but you still have within the Democratic Party those centers of power linked to Michigan and the AFL-CIO. And in many ways, this doesn't necessarily have to be an antagonistic conflict, but it does show that there are these two sort of, um, there are these two tendencies, right, reflected in this sort of broader um, um, debate over who should be labor sector. And it may end up in this really ugly political fight, or it may be that, hey, we need to re really think about that. Like, again, how do we recognize <laughs> abundance and how we're gonna express solidarity rather than be at each other's throats, but we'll see. I love that. Thank you. Um, the next question I see here, thinking about AMB's me, thinking about my comment about the need for black organizers in the movement to learn, acknowledge more Asian and Asian American contributions to movement thinking as well as Scott's examples of how students in his multiracial class engage with issues and histories of Asian America. My question, where do we see practices of mutual regard and shared study among black Asian American and BIPOC organizers, students and teachers taking place? How might we continue to develop spaces for these practices and forms of study to take place? Thanks so much. So I think historically I'm pointing out that Asian American studies comes out of the third world liberation front um, strikes for ethnic studies, those were, so Asian Americans wouldn't exist without this conscious uh, recognition of solidarity with other yeah. BIPOC communities, right? Being part of a movement um, and being part of a global movement against imperialism. This is during the age of, you know, yeah. the anti-Vietnam War movement and other liberation struggles in the global South. So I think that's important. Obviously it's gone in all kinds of directions since then. There's all kinds of new, you know, uh, uh, developments, some contradictions that have arisen. Um, but I think 
it, it really starts there. So I would, I would recommend Gary Okihiro's book, um, Third World Studies, to think of ethnic studies not as we're an ethnic group, but we're part of a third world global majority. That's great. I think as an organizing space, um, I would recommend checking out the Rising Majority, Rising Majority, which grew out of the uh, direct action table at Movement for Black Lives, but grew into this idea of a larger united front effort that is bringing together, you know, um, Latinx, Arab, Black, Asian, all the different folks, indigenous folks, everybody to be in a conversation that takes us beyond the people of color, non-nuanced response to white supremacy um, and gives us a place to be like, how do we have a nuanced understanding of what it is that we're trying to organize and how we're organizing? Um, I've gotten the opportunity to facilitate a few of their gatherings and they're really incredible, powerful spaces. And one of the things that happens almost every single gathering is that there is across a political education moment where folks are really giving updates on here's the stuff that is actually happening inside of our communities. And then we start to be able to find the patterns and the, the, the opportunities for solidarity amongst those organizing patterns. Um, and to understand that it's also, it's so hyper-regional what kind of solidarity can play out. Um, but that's one of the places. And then obviously Detroit, I think is one of these spaces where um, if you come to the Alley Media Project space, if you come to Alley Media Project conference space, I think you'll you'll get to see what it looks like in in action, in lived action. You know, right now the co-director is an Asian American woman and a Black woman, and they are, um, you know, the space is crafted as a primarily from Detroit Black space, but it's also one that all kinds of different people are coming and entering and from their own stories growing, and it's really steeped in Grace's Grace's historic lineage too. So. Oh, and I want to say, oftentimes when we talk about Asian Americans, you know, um, we don't recognize enough the the rich diversity of of the community, even, right. even the activist community, right? So again, uh, oftentimes again, I tried to point out that there are Southeast Asians at the forefront of this work. I talked about the Hmong for Black Lives work and the Twin Cities. Exactly. You know, there's other ways in which Southeast Asians, um, the work that uh, Vietnamese Americans have been doing, Cambodian Americans. Um, there's been a lot of movement work in, in Seattle where I used to live um, around that type of solidarity work. Yeah. Uh, within the South Asian American community, you know, Vijay Prashad did a lot of the early writing that's really uh, laid a foundation for this type of work. There's other people in Asian Americans. I think I saw Natasha Sharma is in the audience. She's been doing this work. Uh, on the ground, there's organizations like uh, DRUM, Desi's Rising Up and Moving. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the most, the greatest people on Netflix today, like Hassan Minhaj or Hari exactly. Kondabolu, they're in many ways popularizing and bringing to these bigger audiences some of the arguments that, that these radical uh, scholar activists like Vijay Prashad uh, put into writing 20 years ago. So exactly. it's, it's really an interesting time. And of course, you know, there's gonna be no shortage of analyses of what Kamala Harris's election means. I was about to, I was like, I was like, we're we gonna talk about Kamala? Well, so one thing before we get to a Kamala moment is, um, what was it? Movement Generation. Movement Generation is another organization that I think would be a great one to look at in terms of if specifically like we said, organizers, students and teachers all coming into one conversation. It's really a space where people are building out their understanding of how we change our relationship to the world, to the natural world. And to, instead of thinking about things as like, oh, it's a climate crisis. It's like, it's a catastrophe. And the catastrophe is actually the single most unifying thing that will happen to us. And so how do we start to organize and prepare ourselves for that shift? And Gopal Dayanini, Michelle Mascarana Swan, other Southeast Asian organizers are at the helm of that work. Um, oh, and I'm just gonna, on the model minority mutiny, that's, I said that's Soya Jung's term. Um, right. So you can read her work at the Race Files website. Um, and she's also based in Seattle. Awesome. So I, I know we're, we're at, at time, time, are we? Yeah. We're four minutes past time. Um, which often happens when you and I are in a conversation with each other. It's just like, it's so good. So um, I wanted to, to check in here. Does it, how do you feel? Do you feel satisfied with our conversation and with what we were able to answer? Well, you know, we're not answering questions. We're really highlighting questions that I think we all have to struggle with, right? And the answers are, it's a process. It's a struggle. It's an ongoing negotiation. It's a collective it's a collective All right. effort. Well, then right? if that's the thing, I think we one last word from you that I would love to hear 
Um, because, you know, one thing that we dealt with in the Black community is when Obama was uh, elected into the presidency, there was this sense of, ah, you know, check mark, like there was some achievement that had happened because we had a Black president. And then we all got to see that um, having a Black president doesn't and in any way equate to we're going to have these like radical revolutionary new policies come into place, especially not when there hasn't been a buildup of uh, a black, you know, feminist or a black abolitionist or a black belief system undergirding that that allows for that leader to to move in some way in alignment with their community. So now we have Kamala coming in as the first, you know, woman vice president who is black and Asian. And I wonder um, for you, if you were to vision. Um, what would be most exciting for you? At, not for what Kamala does, but what do you think is the opportunity for the Asian American organizing community to push and to move with her in that position? Well, I think it's important because to borrow again, another phrase from, from Jimmy and Grace, um, we have to stop thinking like minorities. Otherwise we'll only be in the mode of protest or in the mode of thinking like, this is our little role in the movement yeah. rather than thinking we have a responsibility to, to transform the whole country or, or the yeah. whole world for that matter, right? Yeah. And so with Obama and Kamala Harris, you know, these folks entering politics on that level, number one, we see more of the opportunity for us to play at that level, but we also have to grapple with more of the responsibility and contradictions that come with yeah. leadership at that level, right? When you're at the in the belly of the beast. So I think that's all important. And I think this election was incredibly important. You know, I did some phone banking with some of the folks I see, particularly in, in, in Pennsylvania, I did. Um, not because I was ever enamored with, with Joe Biden or even Kamala Harris for that matter, but because the threat of the counter-revolution, the threat of the fascist right, the threat of the far right seizing this moment of crisis to, 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 uh, to sort of seize power on a, on a long-term way and, and, and create a much worse system than capitalism yeah. is, is really, so the fact that that's been stalled at least temporarily by the electoral defeat of Trump, obviously he's still in office and not leaving, is a big thing. But really, you know, the Democratic Party is not going to give us, you know, a model of revolution, right? And so even within Black Lives Matter, some of the most important encounters have been with, with Standing Rock, right? Have been with Palestine, have been with indigenous peoples. That's th those are the types of readings and, and, and studying I'm doing to go beyond just what Asian Americans can do in this moment. That's great. You know, I think for me, um, the way that I approach electoral organize, because I think I think of myself as a post-nationalist mostly. Like in my mind, the American experiment is actually too large and too far gone, and the foundations are too rotten to ever deliver us some system of justice. But I do think that there are so many experiments within this place that will create for really interesting things when we defederate or de, you know, when we come into smaller things. And that's why I'm like, I'm in Detroit. We're near all the fresh water. We are fomenting revolutionary practice. We're getting into practice of how to govern ourselves for whenever that time comes. And um, one of the things I think is really important though is to me, I just use a, the electoral process to uh, select who I get to organize against, select who do I think I can pressure against and how do I think I can use that pressure. And I do feel like there's a really interesting moment to have someone who comes into office who is Asian and black, but also um, comes from policing at a moment where defund the police is, is making major moves. And to me, that feels like the juxtaposition point that would be most interesting for putting pressure on Kamala Harris um, is this is a moment when the movements um, that your peoples belong to are saying defund the police and moving us towards abolition. And are you gonna be able to transition and be accountable for your legacy in building up this policing system and actually helping us move? I, I think that Again, is the where can we pray, place organizing pressure while we continue moving our revolutionary fronts and revolutionary practices? And you know, I think electoral politics in any way isn't for everyone. So one of the things I often think too is those of us who are um, who can hold that strategy have to engage in those ways so that people who don't want to do it can be. I'm like y'all go foment the revolution, do whatever you need to do, and we want to play many, many, many strategies at the same time because we are nuanced people, we are not a monolithic people. And uh, the thing I always think is the most vulnerable of us, they suffer the most under these differences. When people say there's no difference between the presidencies, I'm like, then you're not in that most vulnerable position. The most vulnerable will tell you the differences very quickly. And so all the time we have to be thinking who is the most vulnerable and how do we 
identify the people that we can best organize to lift the weight on those vulnerable people while also being able to, to move our revolutionary goals forward. Yep, I think that's right. I think yeah. the, the election will make 2021 um, a very different uh, organizing space. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone who thinks that there's any element, even the Bernie Sanders AOC wing of the Democratic Party that has the solutions to all our problems is not grappling with the complexity of, of what, we're, what we need to do to, to yeah. transform humanity. I think one of the things that Grace would say at this point is we all need to be getting in a direct practice of democracy ourselves and a direct practice of governance ourselves. I, you know, one of the things I do with the emergent strategy workshops is the first thing I ask is how many of you practice democracy in your home? How many of you practice democracy on your block? How many of you practice it in your community? And it's so few people raising their hands. It's so few people who are actually practicing governance. And then we are appalled at the way we're being governed. And so for me, I'm like, we have to be in a collective practice of growing our responsibility for ourselves. Um, collective responsibility, not bootstrap responsibility, but collective responsibility for governing ourselves. So I'm tired of making demands from people who don't love me. I wanna be oh. in charge with my people. <laughs> and not to be too much of an essentialist, but one of the Asian things is, you know, you don't stay too long in someone else's house. Uh, Pastor, you're welcome. So I think we should probably get ready to turn it back to Sarah. Right. But I was brought an invitation. I mean, I don't know if you're game, but I would love to do this in other settings. I would love to invite all our other friends that we've mentioned. I would love to. Along the this way. The thing. You know, I feel like Grace left us with the legacy of being in conversation. I think that's one of the ways that we're supposed to teach and learn. So yeah, let's do it again. All right. Um, Sarah, I think that we come back to you for closing out the night. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Scott and Adrian, for so generously sharing yourselves. I mean, your heart, wisdom, imagination. I don't know. I just feel like we needed this so deeply as we near the end of 2020 and as we're looking to emerge in 2021. So I just want to thank you for the many seeds to nurture that emergence. Um, and what a gift to spend this time together. And I'm happy to share this as a community announcement that this time does live on because a recording of this event will be available on Asia Society's YouTube channel in a few days. So we can sink back into this um, and you can share it widely. And um, I also wanted to share that if you would like to receive updates from Asia Society Museum or join us for future programs, we encourage you to sign up to join our listserv at asiasociety.org forward slash triennial. Okay, and with that, um, a final thanks to both of our speakers, Scott and Adrian. We're so appreciative. And thank you for everyone who joined us tonight. Okay, be well. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for having me. Thank you, Adrian. Love you, Scott. Love you too.